All right, well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, the panel here is called Building Professional Community. Uh, my name is Quincy J. Allen, I'll be your moderator. Uh, I've been doing this about 10 years. I wanted to do a quick round of introductions with everybody. Um, we'll do Emily Leverett, if I pronounce it correctly, then Emily, then Maurice, because that's the order in, my com in Zoom. Um, you can find me at quincyallen.com and take it away, Emily number one. It's like the dating right. game. I'm Emily Leverett. I am a writer and editor and a medievalist English professor. And you can find my work, both fiction and scholarship, at Emily Leverett, emilylevinleverett.com. There we go. All right. Um, I'm Emily Kaplan, and I write books under the name E.M. Kaplan. Um, mostly mysteries, some sci-fi, I mean, some fantasy, and some to be determined. And you can find me under just the mwords.com that's em uh my name is maurice broadus uh my latest two books uh I have the usual suspects a middle grade detective novel and uh pimp my airship a steampunk fantasy novel all right so thanks everybody for attending thanks everybody who's going to be watching this once they press play um what i wanted to do was start with the first question was what do you consider to be an important trait when it comes to defining a professional? This applies to writers, editors, designers, cover artists, publishers, booksellers, narrators, and anyone else associated with a book, anthology, or even media industry in general. And we'll just do the same order. I think that'll work easily. So what do I consider a professional or what people need to be to be professional? The traits that make for like right. professionalism, right, um, in this industry. You have to be able to walk up and talk to people. I think that's one of the big things, and especially for a lot of writers, um, that's one of the harder things. Lots and lots of writers are introverts. I'm not one of them, but I, I do know they exist. Um, and that can be difficult. And then I think the flip side of that is you have to know when it's time to walk away. Like you have to be able to read social signals when the person you're talking to needs to move on or has something else they're about to do because that's important too so being able to talk to someone and know when to stop talking to someone um let's see here professional i i think um if you're if you're thinking about what a professional is compared to like an, an amateur maybe um just the bare bones i'd say um if you've written something that well that if you've sold something that you've written I think that that's just the flat, basic way that I would define it. Um, if, if you're talking about acting like a professional or a professional, you know, demeanor, um, you know, there's a bunch of a-holes <laughs> who, are, who are considered professionals. So I, I'm not sure if I would go into like manners or etiquette or anything like that. Um, if you're part of a, a community, maybe, as introverted as as I am, I'm still, you know, part of the online community pretty strongly. Um, I don't know, it's kind of amorphous, but those are some of the things that I throw into the pile of what I call professional. For me, professional, uh, one of the things that, you know, I've been in this for 20 years now. And, uh, you know, even from the beginning, I, I made it one of my things where I was going to always act in a professional way, even when I had no professional credits. So professionalism for me meant, you know, I'm going to take this seriously. This is a serious business. I'm going to take it seriously. And not only that, so I expect the people around me to take it seriously too. So when I'm dealing with professionals, you know, we're taking this thing very seriously. Um, and then I'm going to, and then the other two things basically boil down to this. So one, I'm only going to accept projects that I know I can do. You know, if I say yes to a project, I'm going to hit that deadline. So professionalism, professionalism for me means I'm gonna hit those deadlines. And then also I'm gonna value what I do. I value my time, I value my effort, I value my skill set. And I expect other people to do that also. So you will pay me in a professional way, in a professional time. Uh, you know, that's, that's just nature of the game. If I'm dealing with professionals, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hold up my end professionally. I expect you to hold up your end professionally. I think it's important that the distinction you made, Emily, uh, about yeah, anybody can publish, well, not anybody. A lot of people 
who publish a book, right? They can do it. They put it out there on Amazon. It's become easier than ever before. And so by that base definition, they're a professional writer. But I think that particularly in the context of meeting and greeting with other professionals uh, um, in a, a more public setting, there's a certain level that, you know, I, I like to think that certainly the people I've worked with and met at the cons and stuff for the most part have maintained that level of decorum. It's, it's, I think it's a matter of treating your job, this job, whether you're another publisher, graphic designer, what have you, as simply being, um, you're at work, right? And so there's certain behaviors that we adopt when we're in a, a business setting. And so I, I generally try and associate with folks who reflect that even when we're at a con, even up to a point when we're at the bar con, um, my favorite actually is, is, is the one in, in Atlanta. Um, but when you get the people who get rowdy and so forth, it, I think it detracts from that. So there's, I think there's, there's certainly two standards that we generally try and adhere to. Um, because you can have a newbie writer uh, or a, a newbie artist, we use that term, uh, who can come in with no credentials per se, but comports him or herself uh, in a professional manner. And that's the sort of people that will garner more interest by the rest of us. Um, so, okay, so what are your favorite ways to meet, greet, and interact with other members of the publishing industry? Um, I mean, I mentioned one, the Barcon, but that's, you know, it's a long list and it certainly doesn't, it isn't limited to convention. Um, so Emily, what do you think? This Emily? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so Emily L. We will do that. Emily L. Um, I do like to meet people at, at cons. Um, and when I say that, I mean conventions, but also conferences, because I go to academic conferences, which is just a fancy word for convention and people don't dress up quite as much, but, um, especially because I'm a medievalist, so people do dress up. Um, and to go up and say that you appreciate somebody's work, I think is a great way to meet somebody. If you don't know their work, telling them, wow, that was a really interesting thing you said. But um, I like having conversations with people about writing and writing adjacent things. And so I do really enjoy meeting people at cons. Um, and I've been doing it since about 2008. And, um, it really is, I think, one of the better ways to sort of build a community. Um, that actually, in my, the second convention I ever went to was where I met Maurice, and I'm sure you don't remember. Um, it was in Louisville in the hotel that they put a glass box around. Um, so it was miserable. But that's also where I got to know John Hartness, who is my publisher. And so it was just by virtue of talking to people and hanging out in the same space, whether it's a lovely space, say Dragon Con, or a miserable space, you know? So that, I think just, yeah, I like conventions and things like that. So I think that um, I can point to three milestones in my, in my path so far that um, have, have pushed me to a new level. And the first one was social media. Everybody, well, a lot of people hate Twitter, um, but I met, I've met a lot of writers on there. I've met uh, Robert Bevan. I met Rick Walteri, some of the Authors and Dragons guys in John Hartness, who let, they led me to John Hartness. And um, just, you know, it opened up a whole new path for me where I learned all this stuff about indie publishing. I learned all this, you know, do's and don'ts, advertising, things I had no clue about with it that were just like the, the biggest learning curve out of this whole um, voyage for me so far. And then um, the second milestone I hit was um, for mystery writers. I joined Sisters in Crime, which is, you know, a professional organization. There's also Mystery Writers of America and the same for, you know, other genres. Um, and I met a lot of seasoned authors. I met Sarah Paretsky through that one and um, Gillian Flynn. And that was just uh, mind blowing. Their, you know, their heights of, of success in the mystery world was pretty amazing. And then um, the third was cons, for sure, definitely. Um, I did my local ones in the Chicago area, and then um, I branched out and 
and I came to Con Carolinas and um, ended up moving here. <laughs> and so, you know, making different connections through that in person, face to face is like so important, especially for a person, a writer, you know, you're hunched over your keyboard a lot, meeting people, you know, um, chatting with them just makes ideas happen and, you know, some kind of magic or whatever. Yeah, so uh, for me, it, it basically, it's the same sort of thing. So uh, uh, I, my, my number one way is always going to be cons. Uh, you know, I, you know, because, yeah, cons are just it for me. Uh, I, I love going to conventions. I love, uh, and BarCon is my favorite part of the convention. In fact, I think that's where all of the real business of writing gets done is in BarCon, uh, you know, because you know what, because it's we where we can relax is where we can let our hair down and we can just get to know each other as people. Uh, and, I, and I think when you can get into that setting, that, that those genuine moments, those genuine times of connection, that's where uh, those have always happened for me. Um, I, I've been a member of, of CIFWA, I've been a member of HWA. I'm, in fact, I'm still a member of CIFWA. Um, and, and those can, uh, and those, and even social media. So like uh, when I was first getting on with message boards and things like that, uh, those were okay, but they were all hinged on whether or not we had actually met at a convention, uh, wh whether or not those relationships were truly deep and online, you know, always originated with me meeting them in person. Um, and then as an offshoot, I guess the last, <laughs> it sounds weird, but the last place where I uh, built community is, I, I love BarCon so much, I decided to start my own. Um, and so that's how, how MoCon started. Uh, was me just going, hey, you know what? I love the convention, but I love conventions, and I want to be able to. Like, not not everyone can go to conventions, frankly. Um, but I was in a spot where I could leverage relationships and leverage some of the situations I was in, where like, well, I why don't I host my own convention and have friends come in who my my friends locally may not know, but I know them from going to all these different conventions, and we'll just get together and have a, a mini convention here in in, in my hometown. That way. I can share those relationships with with other writers, and and then by virtue of that, I get to not only build that uh, community locally, but then just tap into uh, that greater Indianapolis, for example, literary community, which I had no uh, connections in. But all of a sudden, it's like they're like, "Hey, you're building community over there. Can we be a part of that?" So, like, yeah, absolutely. So uh, for me, so yeah, so it always hinges on, on uh, conventions. And just that ability to meet with people face to face. Uh, I, I just love being able to connect face to face. Uh, for me, um, one of the best places I found a network, and that really was the, the word for it, was uh, way back when um, I was working as the, I basically ran Kevin J. Anderson's book booth. That was going with Wordfire Press, and that was going to uh, a number of shows. Uh, we did like 20 shows in a year, and I think it was 2015. And so that provided an excellent opportunity because the whole purpose was to have authors lined up behind the table and, you know, basically we're schlepping books, of course. Uh, but, you know, in the downtime between fans and, and people buying books and selling, um, we had an opportunity to uh, actually talk about the business and our interests. Um, and as a result, I, I made a number of contacts that way. So, I, you know, it's, I've never been uh, con comfortable in the sort of the bar setting. Um, I, some people think that's kind of weird, but um, it's always been hard for me if it's a room of strangers to interact with them. I mean, it's, it's a character flaw. Um, once I have somebody there that I can interact with, then meeting their friends becomes much easier. So the actually one of my favorites is the, the, uh, the Weston during Dragon Con is an excellent opportunity to, to, to meet with other authors authors and professionals, editors, publishers, and agents. Even. Um, I actually left that on the list. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, I think it's, it's combining that notion of social setting with, um, with professional setting that, that makes it very easy to have the conversations about our, you know, our work and our interests and so forth. Um, okay, so do you have a, uh, um, you have a favorite convention or center? Did I ask that already? I'm reading off a list if you don't know. <laughs> Uh, so actually, let's, let's go to this one. Uh, what projects, if any, that you have produced or helped produce were a result of building your professional community? Um, let's start at the other end, Maurice. What project have I? 
guns yeah there were direct derivative of the social networking right that professional community because you know we're all writers we generally we, we live in our holes and we do our work but but you know it's it's what projects do you have that are, if any that came from those relationships all <laughs> 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 I, mean, that, I mean, literally. Okay, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, because like, uh, for, for example, you know, all of my major book deals, for example, I didn't necessarily get those through an agent. I got those through relationships I built with with editors directly. Um, from okay. my from my first book, uh, my first book trilogy with the Knights of Breeding Court that, that came through relationships uh, who I had, I generated through a Gen Con, uh, you know. Uh, okay. And so, and then even, and so then, uh, and actually, heck, let me, let me digress a bit. Cause I want to touch, come back to that uh, whole idea of in, introverts at cons. Um, there was a friend of mine and, uh, and she was new, just breaking into the industry and we, and she was at world con and complete introvert. And so she carried around this box of fudge. And so whenever she'd come up to a crowd of people, she was just like, Hey, would anyone like some fudge? And, you know, it's a room full of writers. We all want fudge. So we'd sit there and we'd all, and so she'd, of yeah, so we'd, we'd eat, eat fudge. She'd share fudge. We'd get to know her. And, uh, and she, I think she did that like two years in a row. And I know she had to build up a huge social network just off of sharing fudge with people and fudge as her icebreaker. Um, and then to tie it around that's to the question. Cool. Yeah, no, it was a great, it was a great, it was a genius idea. I, I, I'm kind of, yeah, that's a good one. Well, but then come full circle, she then later on invited me to be a part of her, uh, she was doing a cereal box project. Um, and so I ended up being a part of cereal box because I was hanging out with the fudge lady. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, like I said, most of my projects, I mean, even getting an agent was just about uh, hanging out and being relational and you know, just building those relationships in, 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 in person. So. What's a cereal box project? Is that something I should know about? Um, cereal box is, um, let's see, it's, uh, so it's kind of like, it's kind of based on the writer's room pro uh, process. So they would, they will gather like four or five writers, uh, we'll have a retreat and then, uh, and then we'll basically write a novel together. And so they use a lot of television language. Um, so like, uh, each book is considered a season. And so, each writer that after we we build the book together we plot it all out and then each writer goes back to their uh, respective homes and and each one writes a chapter or two and then there's an editor puts it all together then they release each chapter basically as an audio book ah got so it. it's a really neat pro a really neat process and uh, it's cool and i had no i i'd known about it but i didn't know how to break into it and then all of a sudden i meet the fudge lady and <laughs> suddenly i have an in awesome Oh, Emily Kay, what you? Um, well, last September, actually, I went out to Las Vegas to the the, uh, the first Authors and Dragons convention ever. When I was hanging out in the bar, because that's like, like what Las Vegas is. As one like, does. Oh, it's a bar. <laughs> and um, and John Hartness was kind of complaining that he that people were nagging him to write the origin story for his character in the podcast which is a, a bard, a libidinous bard. And, um, and he was just like saying how he was, you know, his schedule is completely packed until, I don't know how many years in advance. So I, I just, I was just standing there. I go, well, do you want me to write it? <laughs> and he said, shoot me a message. And so basically I, I, that was my first little false staff project just from hanging out in a bar. And since then, I, I've gotten the, um, he, he wants me to write three more, mis three mysteries for him, which is really awesome. So. Oh, cool. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Emily L. Um, I think Con Carolinas is always going to be my favorite because it's my home con. It was the first con I went to. It was where I met a lot of writers that are my friends now. Um, but I know in my academic life, I have two cons that I think are amazing. And one is the International Congress on Medieval Studies, which is way more entertaining than it sounds, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And it's about two or 3,000 medievalists from all over oh, the wow. world. And um, at least it feels that way. And it's held on the campus of Western Michigan University. And a lot of us stay in the dorms. And so it really is like going back to college 
with all the alcohol that goes with it. And then <laughs> okay, that's kind of cool. Um, and so that one is always ridiculously fun. Um, and it looks like there are people cosplaying, but there really are actual monks and friars and nuns that are also scholars that show up in, in their habits and, and stuff. And so it's really kind of cool for that. And anything you ever wanted to talk about that was medieval happens there. Um, that's awesome. The other one is the Pop Culture um, Association of America Conference, the National Conference, which travels all over the country, and I've been to a few times. But you literally can see anything you want about popular culture there. Um, I gave a paper on medieval romance in the Las Vegas Golden Knights um, pre-Stanley Cup final performances. Um, and I met people there that I got involved with, and am co-editing an essay on Terry Pratchett, because um, that's my new area of study, um, Pratchett's Ethical Worlds, so the cover's actually behind me. Um, and so networking happened there, but there's just so many diverse things at both of those. Like I can go listen to stuff. When I got ready to write my current book, my romance novel about Marie de France, who's a 12th century nun, I went to Marie de France panels <laughs> and listened to what scholars had to say, not that I translated that directly, but so places, um, but the academic cons are always just interesting because of the wide array of stuff I can find out about. That's, that's awesome. I guess the, the college setting sounds like a blast, actually. It's been for me 30 years, um, but it'd be neat to kind of go back there and, and, and wrap my head around that. That sounds really cool. Uh, for me, the, the primary one was the sort of the showroom floor. Uh, I mean, I met Rob Ross, I met John Hartness that way. Um, you know, actually it was the halls of Con Carolina, but essentially it's the same thing. You know, you're selling books, you talk to the person beside you. Um, and Hartness was there and he's everywhere. That guy gets around. He's, he's the most connected person I know now. Um, the other one actually for me is uh, Liberty Con. I'm not sure if you've gone. It's an interesting setting. It's a smaller con. Love the folks there. It's, it's sort of a Bane staple. And as a result, that's where I met uh, the folks that are involved with well, Chris Kennedy and the Forestman universe, um, which I've, I've now written one novel with them. Um, I'm going to be writing uh, one more with Eikenberry this year and then one more on my own for Kennedy. And so that setting, I mean, it really is. I mean, yes, it's, a, it's sort of a fan of the genre convention, but it, it's interesting in that it's both con or convention and conference they really kind of blur the line between the two um and and that's I, I found a certain comfort level there of course i've mentioned dragon con before um because it's i mean there's always so much going on there uh and then as a result of the stuff i've done over the years with conventions and just always being there and that was really blind luck because i was working for kevin Anderson. um that was the reason i actually got the deal with mark adelheit on the Reclaiming Honor book, uh, which is actually, it's kind of curious because he was looking for people to sort of help him expand the number of books he could write per year. And he, he, he'd interviewed a few. And then it was actually his wife who had seen me on panels a couple of times. She says, well, what about Quincy? And so I think it's, there's that notion of that presence being at the cons coupled with, I like to think that sort of that general level of professionalism, right? If you're always on stage, people kind of take note, right? And there's, you know, there's the old rule, don't be a jerk. Mm. Different word here. Um, and so, so, you know, it's, it's worked out pretty well. And we've, we haven't touched on this yet, but without naming names, mm. have there been any situations where an individual or group's lack of professionalism forced you to remove yourself from the project, endeavor, or setting? Right? And this is, we're not outing anybody here. It's more a matter of, of, what was a reason for you to say, hey, you know, because Maurice had touched on this too, it's a reason to say, hey, you know, I think I need to be someplace else. Uh, Emily L. Yeah. Um, I almost had one very early on with John Hartness. I had a moment that was that moment. It just went the right direction. When we were editing the first of Bad, which is stories from the point of view of villains, where you get a whole lot of rapist fun stories. Um, and there was one incredibly well-written, amazing story uh, that essentially validated rapists as people who were on a higher intellectual level and therefore allowed to have these moral lapses, I guess. Yes. But I mean, 
it was incredibly well written. And I thought, if he comes to me and says, we have to publish this, I have to leave. And this might cost me my career. Um, because John wasn't Falstaff yet, but I could see that's where he was going. But he read it and was like, oh, hell no. And so, because, and I mean, now I know him well enough to know. Okay. Um, but I did <laughs> have an instance where I was working with somebody and we couldn't make it work because I couldn't get the paperwork I needed to move forward. I, I couldn't I think I understand. contact. And I, I just reached the point where I was like, I can't do any more work until I actually have in writing that this belongs to me. That makes sense. Yeah, and that's, that is professionalism, right? I mean, there's, there's certain standards we need to adhere to and, and hold those around us to, right? I mean, that, that's, um, and contracts are huge, right? And ownership is critical. Um, you know, that's one thing that goes around the whole industry are those people who, um, who basically rip artists off. And then I, I think that's one that's worth sharing that sort of information. Uh, Emily Kay. Um, I haven't I experienced anything really horrible, but um, I, would, I was at a, a, a festival with two other mystery writers. Um, one was a very soft speaker, you know, like you have to lean really close to hear what she's saying. And the other one um, was hard of hearing. So I had one on one side and one on the other, and they were trying to converse. And, and but the the hard of hearing one, she, um, you know, ex, her heart's in the right place, but she's a really old school um, from a really conservative background, and the hard of hearing thing. So she was making comments on people walking by and their appearances oh, okay, at really okay. top volume. And so I, I actually went out and found one of these people who I knew had overheard a comment about herself and spoke to her and, you know, removed myself from that feeling of, of bigotry, whatever, you know, whatever her generation yeah. called it. But um, yeah, that was really awkward, really uncomfortable, but I worked through it. <laughs> Maurice. Yeah, I think the, the, the occasion that springs to mind first is uh, actually born after one of my early writers groups I was a part of. Um, and, and the writers group end, ended up splitting and it split along professional lines. Um, and it's not even in a bad way, it's just a matter of, you know, here are, here are my goals, here's what I'm trying to do in terms of how I want to advance my career, where I want to be, that sort of thing. Um, and I noticed that, it, it, like I said, it wasn't anything negative, it was just I, there were some people who in there who were like, they were writer hobbyists. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. But what you do isn't what I'm trying to do. Um, and they took it as me being, you know, us against them and all kinds of stuff. Like, no, it's not about uh, me versus you or us versus you. It's about I, here's where I, here's the track I'm trying to be on. Yeah. You're on a different track. And hear me, your track is okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your track. But it's not what I'm trying to do. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, and so rather than be a divisive element, I'm just going to remove myself from, from the, the group. That way I can go be about finding those people who are on that track and, and, and we'll go move forward that way together. So. I think if there's a, it's a, I had, it was fairly volatile. Um, it was, I was treating with an individual who was having some difficulty paying folks, right? I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, Maurice, you'd mentioned early on, it's important that we get paid as professionals, that we're always treated as professionals. And so when we, we work with folks who have that challenge, right? And I was, I was torn because the, I had an opportunity to really kind of, quote unquote, go public with it. And I didn't want to. Um, it wasn't my call and it was kind of on the cusp of, of uh, a real transgression, so to speak. And so I made the decision not to do that, but to certainly say, hey, I will no longer be involved in this under any circumstance. And it actually ended up costing me a friendship. Um, I think that there's, there's certainly a fine line. Um, there's certainly politics in this business, right? If you're pursuing the path that you're after, uh, you need to make certain accommodations to do that. But there, I think there are lines that we all have that we don't want to cross. Um, 
and so you know that was that was a struggle for me and it lasted a number of months it's it's all kind of in the past now um but it's important i think that anybody watching if you're in this business um, the one rule I, I always, when people ask me, right, the one rule I always say is make sure you get paid and give everybody one gimme. If they don't pay you the first time, okay, fine. Make sure you get paid up front every time after that, right? Treat people professionally until they give you a reason not to, and then you got to change the rule. We all have to, in many respects, protect ourselves from that sort of thing. Um... I'd add All right. That. So, what are? Uh, go ahead. A lot of us, um, a lot of us, because I mean, we're talking about professional communities, like Quincy, like you talked about with your incident. Um, we are friends with these people. These are not just business relationships. These are friendships. And I will say this right now: if you take That's anything right. away, if they are your friend, they will give you a contract. If they are a friend, they will understand that you cannot give your work for free, except when you give your work for free for charity, or that's all great, but you know. The, but you're my friend, and oh, but we've known each other a long time. It was difficult for me to extricate myself from something that I should have demanded a contract up front, and I should not have waited as long as I did to back out and to deal with it. But community, know the person, surely it's going to be fine. So if someone gets angry at you because you want to know the terms of your relationship, that's a sign that maybe you shouldn't be in a relationship with them. And this just turned into a romance advice thing too. Sorry, I mean, it sort of works across multiple fields. Yeah, that's absolutely the truth, right? It, it's, yes, we're friends. Yes, this is, it's, this is art. Um, we're in the, the process of creation, but this is a business. And in the final analysis, it's business. So you, you have to maintain that level of, and I'll call it respect. Um, and, you know, the, for the, every time you run into someone who doesn't do that, the best thing you can do is walk away. Um, you know, and, and it's so the other thing, I guess, do you have, and this is kind of a general question, it's not on my list. Um, do you have both that, that call it inner circle of people you sort of share all of your experiences with versus the more public uh, community where you wouldn't necessarily, basically it's the difference between sharing your experiences and protecting your inner circle versus a flame war, which I don't think benefits anybody. I mean, um, uh, Emily Kaplan, what do you think? Oh yeah, definitely, for sure. You know, in, in writing and in life, basically, you have the people that, <laughs> whose, whose, whose opinions you trust, you know, tried and true, loyalty, intelligence, you know, all the things that you value and you, you keep them close. And then, you know, you have to branch out. Otherwise you might never find new people like that to bring in your inner circle. So yeah, you've got your trusted, you know, your, your core, whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, you, yeah. you have the, the people that you're just meeting, trying out, it's like swapping in and out. It's, it's fluid, but yeah, for sure. Maurice. Right. Well, I mean, the short answer is yes. It's just that my inner circle is a very large circle. <laughs> Fair so, enough. Uh, so it's one thing, you know, just among professional writers, for example, we, we talk a lot. Uh, and so we, we always talk about, well, who are the agents who are problematic? Who are the, uh, who, you know, who, who are the publishers that are public problematic? You know, what, 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 you know, what, what are different editors looking for? So we, we have all that uh, that we talk about because we have to share information here we're pretty frank about how much do we make yeah. on projects because there's plenty of time when you go to a project and you're like, I don't even know how much, uh, what a professional rate for this project would be. Well, it's good to have those trusted people who you can go to and ask, how much would you charge for something like this? Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side, you know, having been the editor over at uh, Apex Magazine and, and with Fireside Magazine and, and all the other different projects, oh wow, editors talk too. So now who yes. are the problem writers that we've had to deal with? You know, we, these are the conversations we have also because, you know, some writers, you know, are just tough to work with. And so we want to have, we want to be cognizant of that. So it's like having a foot in both worlds is, is really helpful, but just know that it's a large, it's a large circle, but how do we warn people against other writers? How do we, uh, who are problematic, who can get you into those uncomfortable situations? You know, I think I, that's a fair question. Yeah. Right. I mean, there, there's a difference between, um, 
wanting to help and, and protect the, the people in our community mm -hmm. without Cross is a complete jerk, right? Without, without getting the he said, she said, right. um, without affecting someone else's business if they don't, if they don't necessarily deserve or need it, right? I mean, there's the, and did you find it difficult to balance having a foot in both those worlds? Or was that a challenge at all? Uh, no, not really, because, uh, you know, gossip is gossip. So, you know, it's a, it's a skill. <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody talks in this business one right. way or the other. Well, and, and frankly, you know, most of the editors I work with are also writers. So, uh, you know, so okay. it's, it's a little bit of both anyway. So it's, it's really good just to have that broad, broad base that you can just swap information with just to, and, and look out for each other. Yeah, I've yeah. been on both sides as a writer and an editor. Um, I think I've co-edited five volumes of short stories and then worked on a couple others. And so, and then in the academic world as well. And the academic world is exactly the same, um, if not worse, in terms of gossip. It goes really quickly around. Um, and people do try to warn each other. And I have, I have an an inner circle that's sort of a ride or die inner circle. Like there are people I would go all the way to the ends of the earth for, and there aren't a huge number of those people. And then outside of that is a set of close people who we do talk about who is difficult to deal with and, you know, what you're getting into if you agree to work with someone. Um, and everybody talks about that. I had someone ask me about how cliquish writers are. And I said, well, we are and we're not, right? We like, we meet people, we make friends. And so if somebody's like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a cover artist. Like I will recommend the one that did my awesome Wolf in the Cloister if I think it's going to, you know, if I think that they would work well together because that's somebody I know. It's not some vast conspiracy to keep other people out, right? It's just that there are the people that we know, which is why it is important to network and meet people and be a part of a community. If you could recommend one course of action or general philosophy for people looking to break into the publishing or even media industry, uh, what would that be? Let's go with Emily L again. Um, if I had to say one thing, it's when you come to cons, when you come to environments where there are writers and editors and things like that, along with being professional, don't only talk to people about what they can do for you. You have to be there to give of yourself to, because people will figure out really quickly that the only thing you want to talk about is your book and how they can help you. And that's not how you make friends. Transactional relationships don't really work. Um, so when you come in, come in with the idea of community, not profit. That's good advice. Emily Kay. Um, I'd say, you know, other than don't be a jerk, um, you know, listen, listen, to, <laughs> listen to, to, yeah, listen to what other people have gone through and try to, you know, learn from their mistakes. Don't keep making the same mistakes over and over just because you think you've got some special thing that, you know, absolves you from all that. So, you know, listen, let's take a lot in. We're, we're writers, so we should be listeners. So we'll see. <laughs> Maurice, that actually, that was actually both pieces of advice I had, because, uh, uh, you know, I, it was invaluable, especially in, in the first few years, going to conventions and just sitting around the professional writers who were, you know, ahead of where I was or where I wanted to be in, in, in my career, and just listen to what they had to talk about. What were their concerns? What were their goals? Uh, what were they trying to do? Um, you know, it was it was like a it was a college class all by itself uh, in, in the practical realities of what is what is the life of a writer? What does it take to be a professional writer? And you, you only you only can gather that information by listening. Well, putting yourself in the right situations and then listening once you get there. That makes sense. Um, I think for me, the the one and it's something that that I think was Kevin Anderson sort of taught me this. Um, and also Mark Adelheit, which is a recent relationship. But ultimately, it's if you're going to try and be a professional writer and put your books out there, we'll assume it's all fiction. Um, essentially, you're always on stage, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter, um, at a convention, at a conference, 
even when you're, especially if you, you become even more famous, right? You reach the Scalzi, Korea, uh, all, you know, the main authors. When you cross the threshold of your door, whether it's digitally or physically, um, you're on stage and people will, like it or not, judge you for the things you say and do and your general behaviors. Um, and I, you know, I've made a few faux pas over, the, over my years at conventions. Um, a, a couple. I, I actually got talked to, um, this is in Texas, uh, where I, had, I knew, I used to work with a guy who worked with William Shatner when William Shatner was part of the, was it Expedia, I think it was, whichever. And I, I just, I asked Bill, I asked Mr. Shatner, um, hey, do you remember, the guy's name was Sanjay Tiwari. His boss, and after the, it was shortly thereafter. One of Bill's people, one of his handlers, talked to my handler and said, "Hey, as a rule, you don't approach the the big guests." Um, which I, you know, I was at that time I was a newbie, um, but you know, it was, it was a lesson learned in that there's there's certain etiquette and protocol that we we need to kind of be aware of. Uh, ultimately, it's it's you know you you wait for those people to kind of speak to you, reach out to you. Uh, but in general, it's just a matter of we are media personalities, right? We're we're not superstars. We're not on Star Trek. We're not whatever. Uh, but we're becoming personalities, and many of us have, have achieved that. Uh, so I think it's a matter of it's it gets back to that notion of professionalism, in that you have to comport yourself as a professional wherever you go, um, even when you're just getting started, because people remember that. People remember the nice person, the kind person, the conscientious person, and they sure as hell remember the jerks, right? One benefits you, one does not. Um, so before we go, are there any parting comments anybody would like to make? Because I'm, I'm about done. Emily, Emily? Hmm. Buy my stuff? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading your book right now, actually. Oh, the okay. wolf in the cloister. Right on. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I had one thing to say, like your Shatner story is a great lesson, but also for the most part, when you get away from that group of people, do go up and talk to authors. Like all you have to say and actually make it be true is I read your book and liked it and don't talk to you <laughs> like that's true you know don't <laughs> be afraid and and remember that all of us either are still or were as terrified as anybody else that imposter syndrome is everybody and no you probably don't look stupid no they probably don't think badly of you right you just have to breathe and talk to people Anything else, Maurice? Well, Bueller. just to re just reemphasize that community is just it's vital. I mean, none of us have gotten here on our own. We've all had mentors. We we've all had people who've, who've looked out for us. We've all had people who will in make introductions for us at a convention. Um, and so the bottom line for me is, you know what? I can never have too many friends. And so whenever I go to a convention, you know who I'm talking to. I'm not name badging to see yeah. who who's the important person at the convention that it could do something for me. I am talking to whoever is around me because I can never have too many friends. That's a good way to put it. Um, all right. Well, then I, I think that just about does it for us in this panel. Thank you, Emily and Emily and okay. Maurice. Uh, thanks, everybody who's watching. Um, we really do appreciate it. Uh, good luck and enjoy your con in the digital age. Right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.